So good day, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador Alan Katz to Porto Business School. Today, we have the privilege to discuss the current situation in the United States now that we are uh, expecting elections very soon. So we will explore the potential implications of, uh, uh, for Portugal and for the European Union, considering various elections outcomes. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Ambassador Katz, could you provide some insights into the factors that have led the United States into this current political landscape? Yes, uh, uh, th thank you for having me. Let me just sort of say a, a couple things so that people understand why we are where we are. From 1945 to 1985 in the United States, it was the largest expansion of middle class people anywhere in the world. And it happened because productivity went up and wages went up with it. People would graduate high school, they could have their own home, they could have their own family, their spouse didn't have to work, their children could go to college. A long time in the mid 80s, mid 80s, when globalization started having an impact, wages started flattening while productivity continued to grow, cost of living became greater, things became much more difficult for many more people in the United States. The government did not particularly, did not respond particularly well in a number of instances, and the result was the emergence by the time of the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, we had a, a populist revolt, if you will, after that election. And by 2010, you had the Tea Party on the right, on the authoritarian version of populism, and you had the Occupy Wall Street movement on the left, which was sort of the progressive version of that. And what's happened since that period of time is that both the populist movement has grown and the government itself has not particularly responded particularly well to it. And so where we find ourselves in 2024 is still this notion of a significant segment of our population is not being, their issues are not being addressed. The uh, progress for themselves economically and their family has not grown and therefore there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of people interested in change. So uh, how likely is that the former president uh, Donald Trump wins in these next elections? I think if uh, I think that there is a, at least a 50-50 chance that he will win. I think it'll be a very close election. I think that there is uh, all the polling indicates that a large majority of Americans wishes the race was not between Biden and Trump, but it is. And the reality is, is that Trump has a very strong following, but he doesn't have a majority following. How that will reflect itself in terms of who actually votes, the possible impact of third party candidates remains to be seen. I think if the election were held today, Trump may well win, but the election isn't today. And so we'll see what happens come November. Now, moving on, our, uh, our attention to the U.S. and Portugal relations, what uh, specific policy shifts or con eventually continuity can we expect under the different uh, leadership scenarios? So either uh, under Trump administration or Biden administration? No, I think that the, the Biden administration has demonstrated that they're internationalists in nature, that they value international relationships, and therefore, countries like Portugal, who have been long-term friends of the United States, will continue to get a lot of support from the United States and whatever differences may exist, as they have in the past over, for example, lodges and other things. These are things that will all be reconciled, I believe, in sort of the normal course of business. The Trump administration has indicated a real interest in basically pushing back away from NATO, pushing back away from defending Europe. And I think that, therefore, whether Portugal specifically would be affected, they would be affected certainly as a larger part of the European Union and NATO. Uh, I think that there is a clear preference by the Trump administration to, or to the, the Trump campaign and what they hope will be the next Trump administration to sort of focus on America first, an isolationist policy, a very transactional way of dealing with everyone else in the world. In other words, it, it, for us to be part of what's help you, you have to help us. It, it, it is always uh, an immediate transaction as opposed to a longer term transaction. Okay, so uh, going to further relation be, uh, within the European Union, so how might the election outcomes will impact this relationship between the European Union 
and the United States? I think that the biggest impact will be on NATO. I think Trump has made it clear that uh, countries that do not spend 2% of their GDP on defense, uh, which was the aspirational goal that began with the NATO countries back in around 2010, uh, that he's, in his words, he would invite Putin to invade them, which is a fairly severe kind of reaction. Uh, I think that he has no, I don't believe he understands or appreciates the value to the United States security of NATO. And I think what the European Union would have to find itself in the position potentially of having to create its own defense mechanism, its own, raise its own military, and then there's a whole series of questions of whether or not it would be under a joint command, individual countries, all those kinds of things. Yeah, so some challenges ahead, <laughs> okay. Now, uh, moving on even further, um, so consider, considering the global stage now, what implications do these elections hold uh, for economic and maybe military ties with major Asian countries? Well, I mean, clearly the issues uh, involving China are very significant to the United States. Uh, we have a whole series of tariffs still in place that uh, President Trump did when he was a president. Uh, we have the whole question of Taiwan. Yeah. President Biden has made it very clear that the United States would defend Taiwan militarily. The tensions, I think, are, are real and great. China is having significant financial, pro uh, financial issues in terms of the country. Uh, they had a policy of a one-child policy, which is not working out very well for them. So China has got to sort of come to grips with what they're doing. And China is being the, the financial uh, home for the Russians as they prosecute the war in Ukraine, because essentially they've been cut off from money for most of the rest of the world. So I think that the, uh, the implications, the one, the one thing ironically that uh, both political parties in the United States seem to be pretty united on is pushing back on China. And so I think that China does not have the capacity or the, uh, the opening to find an ally in the United States from one party or another. Oftentimes on foreign policy issues, one party will be more leaning one way than the other. In the case of China, I don't think that's the case. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador Katz, for being today with us at Porto Business School. It's well, thank you very much for having me. It's very nice to be here. And uh, as someone who's a former ambassador, I can give my opinions as my own, as opposed to having to worry about anything else. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.